Hi, everyone, and welcome to Knight Foundation Discovery. I'm Chris Barr, Director of Arts and Technology Innovation at Knight Foundation. On Discovery, we talk about things that impact the arts and culture in our communities. And today, we'll be discussing a recent report that Knight Foundation released on digital readiness and innovation in museums uh, with my guest, Kate Haley Goldman, uh, Principal at HG & Co. Uh, lead researcher on the report, and she's going to help lead us through some of those findings. And Loic Talon, an expert associate partner at McKinsey and Company, where he focuses on digital strategy and transformation. And previously as chief digital officer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Welcome to you both. Hello, Chris. So I just want to get started a little bit and talk about, from the Knight Foundation perspective, our interest in uh, releasing a survey like the one that we'll be talking about and the work that we're doing uh, with museums around the countries and specifically in the eight communities where we focus. Uh, I also wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. This uh, is being recorded and folks will be able to access uh, the, the conversation afterwards. And you can ask questions throughout the, throughout the conversation in the chat um, on whatever platform that you're you're uh, watching this on, so feel free to ask questions uh, as they come up and we'll do our very, very best. Um, it, it's hard in a short amount of time to get through everything, uh, but we'll do our best to answer some of those. Um, but we're always available um, on email, social media, et cetera, uh, to answer anything that we don't get to. So we'll try to be accessible as we can. Um, before we dive into uh, some of the findings on the research. So let me just say a few things about the work that we've been doing. So Knight Foundation, uh, as you know, is an arts funder in eight communities around the country. Um, we focus on a number of aspects of arts within those communities. And one of those is digital transformation and how we can help uh, organizations reach audiences in the digital age. Um, we've done this through funding innovation and experiments within the field. Uh, funding uh, field-based learning uh, through organizations like MCN and others, and by funding staffing and capacity building within institutions in our cities. And as we've done this work, we wanted to better understand where the field is at large, right, to, to uh, build that capacity uh, in order to understand not only how well the organizations in the cities that we uh, love and care about uh, are doing, uh, but also where uh, uh, as a field we need to improve in order to reach the opportunity that we, we might have with digital. And this was really what was behind some of uh, the survey that, that Kate helped us with. Um, and part of what was behind the, the matrix and research that came before it. Um, we've been working for uh, a number of years with organizations, taking them through uh, human-centered design training, helping them experiment in new ways and think through uh, the processes really required to, to succeed uh, with digital. And with this survey, we knew we needed some kind of benchmark to, to understand where folks were at around the country um, and to hopefully guide us a little bit about where um, people might go from here. And so Kate, this is, this is where I'd, I would love to bring you in and talk a little bit about the report and some of the, the things that we found. Uh, I should note also, you can find this report online um, at kf.org. Um, if you go to our research section, it, it should be right there. Um, and it's, it's packed full of data and information um, that hopefully uh, we think is useful to the field. Sure, thanks, Chris. And I'll just talk a little before I start the slides that go over the, the key findings with this to give you a little bit of a sense. So this is um, a report where we worked with AAM to contact individuals at all of their member institutions to be able to look at, um, but really focus at art, history, and science institutions with some bit of zoos and aquarias. We get responses from all 50 states and this data set and a few international, but this data set really focuses on the US um, folks at that point in time. And 
it's kind of a funny data set, right? Because there is that response bias, yet still it gives us some really interesting beginning insights, I would say, into where digital literacy is within the museum sector, where that sense of innovation is um, within our uh, within our field. So it, this framework that Chris is talking about draws from other sectors, uh, including business sectors, journalism, et cetera, that have different ideas about digital innovation. And one of the things that intrigued me most about working with Knight is that roots in journalism and seeing an industry devastated by how our society has evolved, right? And we're at this inflection point in museum work and thinking about how digital intersects with that inflection point and then with the pandemic um, gives us some thoughts about where perhaps we want to emerge when we come out of this pandemic. I will say that all the get data was gathered pre-pandemic. So, you know, we have to have that little bit of a lens on it when we go through it. Now, if we could go into, since it's just so short, um, the first really key finding is that size has a huge impact um, on when it comes to digital readiness, as you might imagine. Uh, most of the institutions in the United States are smaller institutions. We defined small as those institutions with a budget of 5 million annually or, or less, and very few staff members. And that brings us to this slide where you can see how the impact of low budget and low numbers of staff, understandably, is low numbers of staff that are directly de dedicated to digital. So, and, and it's a little bit small, but on the far left-hand side of this screen is that we are, those numbers on, we have only one individual or no individuals dedicated to digital within our institution. We can expect that number 62, 62% of small and medium sized, 62% of small institutions have no digital, 18% of medium institutions have only one or less individuals dedicated to digital. And that, that particular finding has implications across all of our other findings. If we go to the next slide, one of the other pieces is about digital strategy. Now, as we all know, digital strategy has been hotly debated within the field, whether it's important to have a digital strategy, have a strategic plan that incorporates digital. And we asked all of those different elements here, but as you can see, a third of the institutions that we talked to had no digital strategy um, at that point in time, and 29% didn't have a digital strategy formalized yet. They're discussing it, they're in the process. So that brings us to, to over half of the institutions who don't have a, a digital strategy in play. Going forward from that, we wanna talk a little bit about outcomes and how digital projects go through here. So this, and I should have added a little bit of title. These are the institutions that don't track outcomes or KPIs. Anyway, so that's 40% of art institutions, 46% of history institutions. Um, that's a really large number, considering that thinking about outcomes is not necessarily a size dependent issue, right? You, this is, you do not need to have robust software and hardware in order to be very intentional about who you're going to be reaching and how you'd like to carry that out. Um, if we go into the next slide, we can talk about how the, here we go, we can see the actual numbers on the far left. So of the small institutions, 45%, but even of the large institutions, 14% are, are not measuring outcomes or defining goals or KPIs with, within this piece. Um, and, and that seems rather shocking given, given our environment, but being in the museum culture, we can all see how this happens, right? That it's, there's this slow erosion of, of goals and outcomes out of time. So this sort of piece in terms of knowing whether we're having an impact with what we're designing is, is, is really not there in the same way that it should be. If we go to the next slide, 
the interesting thing about this data set is that it's primarily leaders who answered. I would say, you know, and I'd have to, I'm not going to go away from the camera at the moment, but it's, it's a high number of leadership individuals that answered. And not surprisingly, they, they rated themselves as very high in support for digital projects. Um, very few people said that they were not, if we can just go back one, if the very few people said that they were not um, ready for uh, digital to be in their galleries, it was not that they were hostile to digital, but they might be unknowing about digital. Nonetheless, um, they had a very high rate of, of interest within that. Going to the next one, we can talk about audience research. And so we asked about a range of audience research types from just from gathering anecdotal data to getting basic feedback like zip codes onto community-based evaluation, iterative formative evaluation, and then strategic and impact evaluation. So what you can see here is that there is a range of different pieces that people are doing. About half of the institutions are collecting some sort of basic feedback within this. But if we go to the line below that, much lower numbers of, in, of institutions are involving their community in any strong way. Um, finally, there's very few institutions that actually look at the impact of their work. Um, as evaluators know, science museums are almost always leading the charge there in that they're looking at the change in interests and behaviors and et cetera that their work pushes forward. But still, it's a, it's a fairly slow num small number in terms of, of impact. And if we then talk about project management. So project management is, is a really intriguing piece. And in my experience, something we don't talk about often enough within museum organizations. And you can see here, we've broken it out. The gray bar represents that there are little to no formalized project management practices or roles. So that varies across institutions, but institutions in total, about a third have no project management. Right, those are some of the top findings that we have through here. And I'm aware that our time is limited. So I'm going to stop at that point and, and open it up uh, to, um, I believe, Loak is going to give us some commentary on where we're at these pieces. W wonderful. Thank you so much, Kate. And, and we do want to get Loak in the conversation here. Um, and there's so much, there's so much to unpack. Um, and, and I think one place I would be interested in starting is around the goal tracking, around the impact and, and out, uh, even identifying uh, our success metrics. And, and if we could start there with some thoughts about the challenges there and, and, and despite this sort of how daunting that might seem, um, how should people think about approaching that particular challenge. Great, happy to, to talk to that. And I'll start by saying thank you for inviting me to be part of this. And I mean, honestly, I, since I can say it, thank you to the Knight Foundation um, and to Kate and your team for doing this research. Um, it's, it's one of those research pieces that you read being like, oh, you instinctively feel some of these pressures, but to actually see data yeah. proving it out is, is, is really fantastic. Um, so to go in, to that point about KPIs, um, I think Kate said it really well when she made the point that having a having a target, having a goal, is not something that money makes easier or size of institution makes easier. That's a mindset question, ultimately. Um, I think it ties to the to the, the project management one, which Kate ended with, and I should to touch on too. But that goal setting piece, how I think one of the challenges that we have with digital and, and cultural organizations, or generally, is knowing exactly what to measure. And we almost get crippled by there being too much data or too many things to measure, or people being in undecided about what is the most important piece to measure. And it ends up in dashboards that have 50 KPIs when no one's actually paying attention to anything. Um, I think the most, the key thing is not to let the, the, the perfect be the enemy of, 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 of the good, like pick two or three data points that you think are, are reasonable starting point data points and just, and stick with them. 
and commit as a team that this is what we're going to go after and get that cohesion right at the start of the project rather than part of the way through and where someone might say, oh, our success criteria is page views as opposed, as opposed to sessions, perhaps. Whatever your KPI, your KPI is. So I think the real thing is like getting that commitment right at the start. I think it's telling the fact that, you know, I think it's 78% of uh, respondents to this survey said that they don't have KPIs where it's on an ad hoc basis, just suggests we don't know where our goalposts are when we're building something. So we actually don't know when we're being successful. And I think that's something that's really important we take on board and turn that around in our mindset. Um, I guess if I can then just build on the last point, Kate, and I, the project management one, because you know it's something that I believe in as well, this, like, this, this process, because ultimately, at the core of this is people, is, 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 is a, a, a staff working in these areas, it's talent, and how they work together and the shared language that they have to deliver projects becomes very important. And you know, I think of ways of working around agile or teaching people scrum and getting that common language to deliver projects starts putting KPIs at the front as well. And I think if, you, if people could start agreeing their project management language as an organization, I think that'd be very helpful. And that's something you see come out of this. There's so little of it, I think that'd be another way of really stepping up where it's not actually a significant financial challenge or a size constraint. It's just an agreement among a group of people to work the same way. And I should note again, right, that this, this survey was done pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a snapshot of where this, the field stood in 2019. Um, and we're experiencing a much different environment, obviously, right now. And out of that is coming, I believe, a lot of creativity and a lot of folks working in different ways. Uh, and I wonder if either of you could speak to things that you're seeing that look like f folks starting to move in the direction of changing processes, changing the way they manage work, communicate internally, et cetera, uh, just anecdotally thinking about how organizations are, are addressing this particular moment. Sure, I think early in the pandemic, we saw this great explosion of creativity or creativity mixed with fear, right? In trying to figure out what we could do to continue to reach our audiences. And there were wild and wonderful programs that were occurring because we didn't know how to do that yet. And it was this sort of design thinking, brainstorming moment where in some ways where museums let their guard down a little bit about trying new things in that attempt. Where we fell down there is, I don't think we've had reflective conversations about what we feel like worked, right? So we went through the experimentation phase and then didn't have the reflection phase in that same piece. I will also say that the digital folks that I work with tell me that digital is more valuable than ever, obviously, right? And more tasked within their institutions than ever. So I do see coming out of this, a stronger reliance on digital, a knowledge that that is an essential, not a nice to have when you're incorporating those pieces. Um, in, in seeing the divides between pre-pandemic, between institutions who were, were more developed in their digital innovation, what moved small institutions up was some amount of staff and some amount of skills. Mm -hmm. Moving from, from medium to large, the difference was that lack of strategy, right? And so you could really see that what can lift up a, a, a small institution who's doing exceptionally good work in digital might be that small amount of staff and that small amount of, of strategy and measurement that would, would allow them to get to the next level. So that's sort of projecting into the future, but I'll, uh, Loak, you, I'll hand it to you. I, know, I think I, I would only build on what you said. Um, I think those early phases, I think we at McKinsey, we gave a seminar in June um, to museum leaders about reopening which almost now seems like the world has changed so much since June. I mean, we almost laugh at the idea of reopening was the main topic and so much has changed in that time. And you know, so I think it forced museums, cultural organizations to be more agile. It literally obligated that agility. And I think there was a reactive phase, but now I look at organizations thinking like, what will be the business model behind this? I mean, the business model of institutions is being significant, hugely disrupted right now. 
And whilst there's that moment where if, if it lasted for a short moment in time, there could have been a digital burst per se to cover a gap. But now the question is like longer term, what does this look like as a business model if people are really leaning into digital as a main platform? And that's conversation I, I, I hear more and more. I think, it's a, I think it's an important one to be having. It's almost one which is, has, should have happened probably earlier without needing a pandemic to provoke it. Um, you know, I think institutions had their moment where they were digitizing their collection and they're getting their content online and then they became a little bit more, I hope, audience focused and were started digitizing their audience. And now we need to kind of get into digitizing their business model. I think those, that's a conversation I see people going along right now. And there's a lot of focus on that business model component. The other interesting thing in seeing some, of, it doesn't directly address one of the questions in the Q&A, but what, it's a fascinating point at this point because the audience research baselines have been wiped away, right? Mm -hmm. So the people that are coming to our institutions, that mix of local, regional, international is not the same as it was before. For some institutions, that's an exploding growth in local visitorship. And for other institutions, it's a very different story. But not only has the mix of visitors changed, but the motivations for why we are going has changed in the context around that. So people who are seeking different types of experiences and they're engaging with different, you know, mixes of people or less mix of yeah. people when they do this. So the, the research that I would have done a year ago is not necessarily valid in an institution as they get to know perhaps even the same visitors who have now different characteristics. Um, and I, mm -hmm. I think coming out of the pandemic, then it becomes very important to be in touch with what who is visiting your institution right now and what their needs are and how those needs are evolving. I, I think that's a really wonderful point, Kate. And it, and it makes me think about starting points, right? And so where, where and how do you start to do this work if you, if you haven't been, um, doing much with digital within your institution, um, there can be a knee-jerk reaction that, um, you know, one, oh, that's great for the Met um, and, and the like, um, but it's not really what we do. Um, meanwhile, um, where do we start? And I think you point to one starting point, which is start with the audience, right? Understand uh, the needs of the folks that you serve, uh, work on that first before you ever start designing solutions that, that meet those needs. And, and I, would, I would also sort of say that's a perspective that Knight Foundation holds as well, um, that understanding um, the folks that we're, we're producing work for is vitally important. Um, two, um, there might be some easy um, spots. And um, look, in, in, our, in our conversation earlier this week, you, you talked about the kind of decisions, even basic decisions about websites, about uh, social media, et cetera, that, that folks are, are thinking about right now. And can you talk a little bit about starting points there and shifts in mindset that, that organizations might make as they're approaching those decisions? Sure. I think the way, I, the way I see this, and the, the data shows this idea that 50% of institutions have one or less organization, one or less person working in digital in the organization. And that's, you know, when Kate, you could, if I'm right or not, but I, I, I assume that's, that may even be high, ultimately, because more digitally minded organizations may be answered the survey. But anyway, even if, if it is 50%, the idea that each of those institutions with their one or less person is going to crack this on their own, I find difficult to believe. I, I just, I, I don't see how it's humanly possible, no matter how talented the people in those institutions are. So I actually think right now we need to look at how those institutions, like rethink actually how those institutions work together, how they collaborate to build solutions, honestly how funders fund impact in that area to obligate that kind of collaboration. So it's a, a team of people maybe working across multiple institutions. Cause I'm also very conscious that those organizations where there is only one person working on a digital, working in digital, when that person leaves, you then see a drop away again. There's no continued transformation. I think if we start rethinking how, they, how, how we're actually working in digital in these smaller organizations, and then start thinking, then have that good conversation about, our KP, about what our KPIs are, what our goal is in using digital, I think we'll find there are tools 
which are which are accessible. I mean, even it can be as simple as making sure your institution's um, Google Maps profile is entirely up to date, that your Google profile is up to date, that your social media presence is up to date. And even those kind of areas maybe should arrive before you even think about building your own website, because those may reach your KPIs in terms of reaching new audiences or getting, getting people engaged with your content. I think people very quickly go towards the platform. Again, if we think about how we work and we think about our goals, I think we'll have more success. I think we, we do have a problem in our field on pipeline, right? So the small institutions can't get the digital project managers mm -hmm. that they need with those skills. And yeah. that pipeline extends all the way up into larger institutions or more well-funded institutions mm -hmm. who then end up getting folks outside of the field because that's where the larger population of these skills are, or they don't trust the, the, the skills that have been grown through the museum field. I think there is a, a pipeline problem in digital with museums and that that extends all the way through our field. I, I wanna talk a little bit more about, and this isn't really covered in the report, but um, uh, Loic sort of moved us towards this conversation and uh, the idea that we need to work together more as a field. Um, uh, here we're talking about how well individual organizations have staffed and organized digital individually. Um, we do have an aspect of partnerships here and certainly there are partnerships with industry, with technology, with outside vendors. All of those things are part of the equation. How do you all think the field should be collaborating with each other. Um, if we think about large scale projects like Tessitura on the ticketing mm -hmm. side, et cetera, um, there have been successful uh, attempts um, to, to think about technology that benefits uh, a field. How should the museum field be thinking about this particular moment, especially as we know we're under-resourced, right? And if we're under-resourced as a field, um, how do we pull those resources better to get where we need to be with technology? I will give a, I, as someone who, who I'll say left the field, but left the cultural organization a little bit ago, I, but, but the one commentary I really feel in this area is I think the cultural sector was probably the most collaborative or is the most collaborative sector. Um, the amount of sharing between institutions on knowledge is, is incredible, the generosity there. Where I think the next step is actually, it's, it's building things together. I think the Tessitura example is a really good one where a group of institutions came together to solve the software issue that we were facing. Um, you know, I look at uh, Europeana, um, it's a slightly different model, but again, a group of organizations coming together and, and effectively the governments at that stage deciding to combine resources to achieve something and to get, to get collections online. Um, I could look at what the Cooper Hewitt announced recently around, around creating a lab, the number of organizations to really rethink what the visitor experience is. I think those formalizing those kind of collaborations and trying to build something out of it, I think is the next step rather than the, and going beyond the very generous sharing and collaboration we already have inside the sector. And, and I just want to give a, a plug as well, um, thinking about knowledge sharing, there are lots of fantastic places where we see um, museum technologists and museum professionals, et cetera, um, coming together to share knowledge. We wanna thank, of course, AAM for their support uh, of, of this survey. Uh, I would also point to the MCN conference, which is happening in two weeks. This is a really important space um, for uh, folks who are working within technology uh, fields. And so that's virtual. And if you're getting anything out of this conversation, uh, then I would say that's a place for you as well um, and to make sure that you attend that. Um, I do wanna get to uh, a few questions that are, that are coming in. And, um, and I would say a lot of those folks are, folks are thinking about the future uh, as, as you can expect. And, and so as we think about transformation, uh, and digital transformation and what the future looks like. And, and none of us are fortune tellers uh, and predict the future, but what thoughts do you have about the kinds of things museums might transition to in their digital thinking going forward? Um, I think 
there's there's a lot unresolved in terms of digital interactives and how we're going to work with those in physical spaces. People feel safest with their phones. So some of the AR-based experiences, kiosk-based experiences, all of that that I'm working on now, we're, there's a movement to controlling it on your own phone. Now that is difficult um, to play in, in many ways, not ideal, but in, in some ways it also gives a, an amount of control to the user. We're seeing um, some amount of digital experimentation, especially with my colleagues in the theater sector. And those experiences are very interesting in terms of how can you make Zoom feel like a different experience within that. And then I would say the libraries that we've been working with, we HG and Co just wrapped up a large project with the Urban Libraries Council. And looking at that, libraries have to be very responsive to what their communities and patrons need. And they are seeking that sort of input right now. Where are the communities broken? And where what is libraries role to do that? And while I see some effort from some of the museums within this. It is still how are, are we going to emerge, we meaning the museum rather than we meaning the community from this. And so that mindset shift hasn't quite happened there. And while my work, every single institution I've worked with in the last few years has asked me about relevance, until we make that mind shift moment, the relevance question becomes very, very difficult, I would say. So there is exciting opportunities within this, but I would say that we have a long way to go in the process of our thinking. And I, I have another question here, and, and this, this one is, one that's really interesting to me because it gets to something that I think is embedded within digital culture, and that is um, collaboration, participation, uh, and co-creation. And a question from the audience, do you find new ways that museums are reaching out to communities for digital content? Uh, do those include things like outsourced exhibitions, et cetera? So, so what are the opportunities, right? Um, you know, I think museums as sort of places where lots of expertise uh, is held and where knowledge is shared with the public, what opportunities do, do the digital space help those institutions reverse that flow where knowledge is flowing into the institution from the community as well? Do you see, do you see opportunities there for co-creation? For, I see opportunities for feedback. I would say co-creation, I have a fairly high bar for. In, <laughs> in co-creation, you are not only proposing solutions, but you're defining the problem, right? And we tend to hold that problem in a, in a culturally dominant fashion of this is, we've decided what the problem is and now we wanna invite some of the community in to help us think about the solutions mm -hmm. rather than sitting with our communities and figuring out um, how that community views the problems at stake and then, and then doing solutions. I would say the opportunity for feedback though has been wide and diverse, right? And so the amount, the, the chat-based components, the public programs that are online, I think that that has brought museums and their, their visitors closer together in some ways in dialogue that is happening in chat at times or discussions at times that we don't see happen in quite the same way in person. Great. Um, well, we are a little bit over our time, but I do want to do a, a quick final round. Uh, this, is, this is a lot to um, absorb, um, but I, I do think it's important that uh, we, we know where we're at uh, and we start to think about where we're going. Uh, and as, as folks make the really difficult decisions that they have to make within their institutions, not just about digital, but also um, about the ways that they're addressing their community needs, the ways uh, that they're thinking about social justice, the ways that they're thinking about shifting their programming in all sorts of ways. 
uh, not, and on top of that, just trying to get open again. What's one easy thing that folks can think about um, that, that might make digital feel a little easier um, to approach? I will, um, one of my favorite phrases in digital and something my, my former team would go crazy, me just repeating, is just do the fundamentals brilliantly. I mean, do the fundamentals brilliantly. It's digital, I mean, I, I want to say it isn't this big flashy gizmo-esque augmented holographic thing. <laughs> um, it's, it's not, it's, it's just a way of exchanging information and connecting with people and doing the fundamental components of digital well of building your digital presence. I'll go back to like someone's Google profile, making sure that their SEO is good, page load time, good visitor information. Doing those, that fundamental work well, I think it's the number one piece I would really, I'd push towards. And I, you know, I, as we come out of, as we hope we come out of the pandemic, you know, I think of the other, the, 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 the huge conversations in the US and globally that have been brought up by the Black Lives, Ma uh, Black Lives Matters movements. Um, you know, how museums are relevant and how, in and how inclusive we can be becomes a big part of how we work. Um, I like to think that digital provides us the tools to really participate in those conversations. I think that's something that I really hope becomes part of the mindset of cultural organizations. Wonderful. Kate, a closing thought? Um, on a practical level, I, I do think it is getting to know your visitors and, and developing some, some basic skills, possibly project management skills for the small organizations and for the large organizations really putting through that intentionality in, in their strategy, um, that we should be seeing a movement towards that within, within strategy. From a, from a more abstract um, point. I think that the, this is the moment that we can think about using our cultural capital for good. And that if we build up all this trust and respect, then we need to be able to spend it on the things that we believe in, and that we need to be willing to, to give up that sense of authority in order to be able to move into the next stage. And that means inviting outsiders out Outsiders to come to the table and and talk to this. And when I say outsiders, I mean things like everyone from politicians to school teachers to to children to to the table to to be able to have a more robust conversation. Without that change in who holds authority, then I think it's a very difficult future. But we have such an opportunity at this moment. Wonderful, and that's a a wonderful place to end it, Kate. Loic, thank you both so much for joining us today. I, I do want to remind folks, if you want to dig into the report, it's online at kf.org. Uh, you can find past episodes of this program online at kf.org slash discovery. I want to thank uh, the folks helping bring this stream to you, Raul, Justin, and Grace. Thank you so much. And our exit music um, is from the great Theron Brown. Thank you all for watching, and thanks. Have a great week for the conversation to continue. It's important. Absolutely. Find us online. And I'll just drop in there, bar at kf.org if you want to reach me. Uh, or hey, Chris Barr is the Twitter handle. Love to talk more about this stuff. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.